So thanks very much, um, everybody, for joining us. So this is a presentation uh, by myself that, of course, reflects the insights from our uh, fantastic team at the forum, as well as insights that we've garnered working in collaboration with many partners around the world over the years. Um, we added this webinar to the series because we realized that uh, while myself, uh, colleagues like Kale and Moat and others uh, have given this or similar talks uh, in a number of different settings, we've never actually done it at the forum. Uh, so we wanted to take advantage of the webinar series to share the lessons learned. If I move on to the next slide, uh, and I'm going to come back to this summary slide <clears throat> after I've walked through the 10 lessons, but these are the 10 lessons that uh, we've picked up over the years. I think of these as being the, the substantive lessons that we've learned uh, from our own work and, and, and collaborating and watching closely the work of our partners. Uh, we've also, I think, learned how to better communicate our work, and I have one slide about that after the 10 lessons. We've also learned a lot about uh, how to function as an organization from a more operational uh, basis as a group that tries to be very responsive uh, to the needs emerging from the system and to work on very tight timelines. Uh, I'm not going to talk about those operational lessons learned today, but um, we do have a new initiative starting with partners in 14 other countries where we're documenting those. We're up to 10 lessons learned right now, but we anticipate that uh, we'll enrich those lessons, and I'm sure we'll end up uh, at 10 uh, very quickly. The other thing that I'm going to do when I finish the 10 lessons is talk about uh, for new directions that we're heading. So uh, these are more emergent areas, and we haven't yet derived lessons from them, but uh, we hope that if we were to give this webinar uh, in a few years, that we'll have lessons emerging from those four directions that we are uh, focusing on now. So on to the lessons learned. I typically have one at most two slides for each of these. The first is uh, be clear about the goal. And in a few past webinars, we've talked about this goal, uh, but I want to go back to it um, for those of you even who've seen it before uh, because of how we have come to realize that to, to achieve this goal, we really need analytical capacity in three areas, which you'll see at the bottom of the slide. We need it in policy analysis, which is the top part that I'll come to in a minute. We need it in the area of political analysis, which is the bottom part, the second bullet point. And we need uh, to be able to do systems analysis, uh, which comes in primarily in the options workup. Um, so that realization has come to us relatively recently that, in fact, when we think about this goal, it means we need three very distinct types of analytical capacity. But to come back to the goal, what we think that we're trying to support when we talk about evidence-informed policymaking is using the best available data and research evidence systematically and transparently in the time available. Sometimes that will be minutes and hours, other times days and weeks, other times months and years. And we need to do it in four areas. Better understanding problems or feeding into agenda setting, better helping people to choose among options, which is the policy or program development phase, ensuring that the chosen option makes an optimal impact at acceptable cost, that's feeding into implementation, and then looking at monitoring and evaluation in terms of what needs to be done. So that we consider to be policy analysis, and our goal is to try to get best evidence, citizen values, and stakeholder insights into that type of an analysis. The second part of the definition recognizes that we're trying to influence policy, which in most countries uh, means that we're subjected to uh, uh, democratic forces where different groups are elected at different times to make tough decisions on our collective behalf. And those elected politicians are making tough decisions under an array of institutional constraints, facing interest group pressure, uh, considering citizen values, and many other sources of ideas. So in other words, at the end of the day, policymaking is inherently political. 
Um, and we think that it's very important to be able to do political analyses as an adjunct to the policy analysis so that you can better identify windows of opportunity, what might make sense at particular times, and try to therefore have a greater uh, impact. Uh, and then I mentioned already that the systems analysis comes in particularly helpful in that options workup by helping us better understand what's currently uh, functioning or, or not in given systems, the governance, financial, and delivery arrangements, and how we can intervene differently with those arrangements to improve systems. So that's the first lesson learned, that we need to be clear about the goal and for us that we need analytical capacities in those three very distinct areas. The second lesson learned is that we need to learn and use a systematic approach to analyzing priority issues. Uh, I failed to mention at the beginning that while I'm looking at 10 lessons, I'm also singling out for these five of the methods with which we've got the greatest traction. And, and one of them here is workshops for policymakers on how to fit evidence in to their traditional approach to analyzing priority issues. So we find it helpful to unpack problems and their causes options and implementation each separately. We also find it helpful when trying to understand problems to think about risk factors or conditions separate from whether we're currently using the right program services or products and those two things in turn separate from how the system is currently organized in terms of existing governance, financial, and delivery arrangements. Where the literature exists, how it's talked about, and so on varies according to which of those you're dealing with, and we find it helpful to dissect out uh, problems and their causes in those ways. When we come to options, um, you can either be thinking about adding, dropping, or changing program services or products, or changing governance, financial, and delivery arrangements. Uh, the forum is particularly focused on that second bullet. Uh, there are groups that are out there in health systems around the world that do an excellent job on helping to choose among clinical programs and services or clinical products like drugs. There are other groups that are more focused on public health programs and services. Our focus is much more how do we help systems to organize themselves to get the right program, services, and products to people. And then finally, on the implementation front, we find it helpful to think about once a, a course of action is chosen, how do we diagnose the current drivers of what's happening in the system that will influence whether that option gets taken up, and then how would one design and deliver an implementation strategy that makes sure that that option makes a difference on the ground and affects the people uh, whose lives that we're trying to influence. So that's our second lesson learned. Use, uh, learn and use a systematic approach, and we primarily operationalize that through workshops. Uh, third is look for the right types of research evidence. I'm not going to go into detail about this, but uh, the research literature is very fragmented. You have people that build entire careers on answering particular types of questions that might give us insight into some aspects of policy problems, or they might give us access, uh, insight into how we think about particular uh, features of options, or they might be particularly helpful on the implementation front. So what I've done in this slide is to give you some of the language that we think about when we're trying to understand problems, options, or implementation, and then the types of jargon that's used in the research world uh, when people are trying to answer those types of questions. And our view is that good evidence-informed policymaking is drawing on all of these types of research evidence. If I now move on to oops, lesson three, just a continuation, um, some additional points uh, here in terms of looking for the right types of evidence. Our view over the years uh, has been that systematic review should be where we look to first for answers to those questions. Uh, and I define what I mean here by systematic review. We think it's very important that policymakers be helped to rapidly identify the quality of the review, 
to understand where the included studies were conducted to help them assess the applicability of the evidence and to be able to rapidly pull out the key messages. And we think that in order to do that and to foreshadow the fourth lesson that I'm going to talk about, we think it's very important that policymakers know the right one-stop shop to find pre-appraised evidence and evidence that flags this type of decision-relevant information so they can make use of it very quickly. So these one-stop shops can give them what they need quickly and comprehensively, but also these one-stop shops, if they go to them preferentially, they will be reassured that there's a very good chance they're not missing evidence that might be sitting in other databases because typically these one-stop shops are searching all of these little suspects in terms of sources of research evidence, so they have done the work for you. If I now talk about looking in the right places uh, for research evidence, so I'm going to uh, talk in particular about another one of our methods, health systems evidence. Uh, but first, I'll mention that sometimes uh, the forum addresses what we know about clinical topics, which are the right programs, services, and products. When we need to do that type of work, our first go-to resource is access. Uh, it provides only high-quality studies, so it, it looks at, at the literature being published in high-profile journals. It extracts only those that meet minimum quality standards, and that's very helpful as a first point of contact with the literature about clinical topics. When we think about public health, we go to the one source of pre-appraised synthesized research evidence in that space, health evidence. That helps us with questions about benefits and harms of public health programs and services. But where, when we're in our the space that we work in 90 or 95 percent of the time, which has to do with how we organize ourselves to get the right programs, services, and products to people, we go to health systems evidence, which includes quality rated systematic reviews. It allows for filters that allow you to search the literature in a number of ways. It provides links to user-friendly summaries. You can save documents as well as searches. You can sign up for monthly evidence services, and it's available uh, for searching in five different languages. So lesson learned number four, look in the right places. When we run workshops for policymakers and we ask them to be honest and tell us where they currently go, the answer is almost uniformly Google. Uh, our view is that is making your life exceptionally difficult. And if you're trying to answer the questions in the, the slide about lesson learned three, um, you'll see that you need to look for many types of evidence and these one-stop shops like HSE are very helpful. Um, continuing on this uh, fourth lesson learned, we've increasingly found ourselves working at the intersection between health and other sectors. Uh, and when we began working in this space, we were frustrated by the lack of a one-stop shop. Um, so one of our recent uh, big areas of focus has been to develop a new one-stop shop called Social Systems Evidence, which contains quality-rated quality reviews in 16 government uh, program and service areas. And in the box on the right, uh, you'll see the spectrum of areas that we currently cover. For those of you who know the Sustainable Development Goals, we're currently covering all of them except for parts of the one related to health, which is covered by the databases on the slide that I just went through, part of seven, which is about energy, and the three environmental goals about climate, land, and water. Uh, but we're fairly close uh, and hope to be uh, successful in reaching an agreement very soon with a partner uh, that will allow us to fill those remaining gaps in the evidence, in which case we'll soon be at a point where we have a one-stop shop for all of the pre-appraised synthesized research evidence about the SDGs except in the health space because those are so well covered by the three databases that I just mentioned. This database will function in very, very similar uh, to health systems evidence, but we here won't just cover the governance, financial, and delivery arrangements. We'll also cover uh, the program services and products. 
So if I now move on to uh, lesson five uh, from the forum's uh, now almost 10 years experience in supporting evidence in foreign policymaking, this one is that we need to package the best available evidence in the right format and on the right timeline. And here I've singled out one of the four examples, uh, rapid syntheses, as a method that is, is uh, getting significant traction. At the bottom, uh, you'll see that I've defined best available as being the highest quality and most locally applicable evidence. But here for packaging, I give you four examples, user-friendly summaries of the research. To our knowledge, there are eight groups in the world that are producing summaries of systematic reviews. Uh, all of those groups, or as many as have produced a summary, are linked to from health systems evidence and social systems evidence. Rapid syntheses are something that we started at the forum three or four years ago. Originally, we provided them in three, 10, or 30 business days. We now provide even more comprehensive syntheses on timelines of 60 and 90 days. Another lesson learned within this lesson five uh, is that we are increasingly being asked to summarize not just the best available evidence, but also to conduct what we call, sometimes call jurisdictional scans to better understand who else is doing what in other jurisdictions. Um, we also, though, look for evidence because it could be other jurisdictions are doing very interesting things, but there's absolutely no evidence uh, that those other things are achieving better outcomes at lower cost. Uh, so those are our rapid syntheses. We also produce evidence briefs, but they are for us not an end in themselves. They are an input to a stakeholder dialogue, which I'll talk about under the next lesson learned. Um, and these evidence briefs try to address that full range of, of questions that I mentioned when I was talking about lesson three. So they provide the health and the political system context. They describe a problem and its causes. They present what's known about three options to address the problem, or what we've found over the years is that increasingly we're presenting not three mutually exclusive options, but instead three elements of a potentially comprehensive approach that could be given more or less emphasis, that could be sequenced in different ways. So there are still significant choices to be made even with an elements approach. Uh, rather than an options approach. And then finally, key implementation considerations. So these evidence briefs are the full summary of the broad array of, of uh, questions that are answers to the broad array of questions that need to be answered. And more recently, we've added citizen briefs that fulfill a very similar function, but here the target audience is citizens rather than uh, stakeholders in the system that have might, might have more uh, technical background in the area and more facility with the language uh, that's used in the sector. So this is an effort to explain in more plain language what the issues are and what's known on a topic. Here, too, they're not an end in themselves. They're an input to a citizen panel, which I'll come to next. Lesson learned six, which is another one of our more recently learned lessons. So uh, it's only been a few years that we have had a citizen panels program at the forum. But we came to realize with our stakeholder dialogues that try as hard as we could, uh, we were not successful in bringing diverse citizen voices to the table through our citizen uh, through our stakeholder dialogue program. We always have citizens in the room, uh, but no matter how much preparatory work that we put into it, and no matter how much support we provide to the individuals, it is extremely difficult as a citizen. Uh, to sit around the table with top government officials, the heads of nursing and, and medical associations, the heads of a variety of institutions like hospitals, and hold your own in that conversation and add value. So while we still involve citizens in our dialogues, we now have standalone citizen panels uh, that have features that are in many ways similar to the panel to the dialogues that we've run for now almost 10 years. Some of the ways that they're different uh, from our dialogues are our attentiveness to diversity. So we have a set of fixed criteria for which we always seek diversity. 
Uh, so those are gender, ethno-cultural background, and socioeconomic status, to give three examples. Um, but there are also uh, criteria or characteristics that are typically unique to the topic at hand. We're typically looking for people with lived experience as an individual, a service recipient, as a family member, or as a community member with the topic at hand. The other ways that our panels are different from our dialogues are that our focus is much more on values. What are the values that citizens believe should guide decision making on the topic at hand? So with our stakeholder dialogues, when we're dealing with groups that have a lot more background knowledge about how the health or social system works uh, and much more of a technical facil facility with the issues at hand, we can get into much more specific insights about what needs to be changed and how. With citizens, though, what is so powerful is hearing from them what values they believe should drive decision making. So that's lesson learned six, a more recent lesson for us about the power of citizen voices in influencing policy processes. Lesson seven uh, is one that uh, we learned in the very early days of the forum, and in fact, uh, it, it in some ways was a lesson learned before the forum was created and uh, contributed to the founding of the forum. This was our first signature program, our stakeholder dialogues program. So I mentioned before a number of shared features with citizen panels. Some differences are we have a separate deliberation at the end of the dialogue, which we don't have with our panels, where we discuss who could do what differently. That's the first of the asterisk points in the uh, left-hand column. Uh, here it's informed by an evidence brief rather than a citizen brief. Here, the discussion is informed by a discussion of all of the factors that will influence decision making. So the politics of the situation are very much uh, part of the discussion. We can convene both those who will be involved in decision making and those who will be affected by those decisions. I mentioned before that includes uh, citizens, but it also includes heads of organizations, not-for-profit uh, entities, uh, regional health authority directors, and so on. Uh, many of the other attributes, though, are similar. So that's our seventh lesson learned. Uh, one other comment about this lesson is we have over time come to find kind of a natural time frame for these, uh, which is roughly in the 2022-week 20, time period from a call to a decision. Um, uh, the fastest we have ever been able to do this is seven weeks from a call from a top government official to, in this case, a cabinet decision. Uh, but if we're not under that kind of tremendous time pressure, we find that a natural time frame that we can work on very easily without, uh, in quotation marks, breaking a sweat would be in the 20 to 22 weeks range. So this is in contrast to the one-stop shop like health systems evidence or social systems evidence where you get your answer in, in seconds or minutes. The rapid response service, which provides answers in 3, 10, 30, or now 60 and 90 days. And the stakeholder dialogues, on the other hand, typically in the 20 to 22 week range. And if we add in one or more citizen panels, that it adds in about three or four weeks to the timeline. So if I now use, um, it jump to lesson eight. Uh, lesson eight is about using the resulting story to drive change. So in the early days of the forum, we were very focused on evidence and all of our communication was about the importance of evidence. We still think evidence is absolutely essential and evidence informed deliberations about values, um, which is what we try and do through our citizen panel program and evidence and values-informed insights from stakeholders, which is what we try and elicit from our stakeholder dialogues, are uh, both absolutely key. But we find that combination of the research evidence from the evidence brief and the citizen brief, 
citizen values from the citizen panels and stakeholders' experiential and tacit knowledge, hugely helpful uh, to policymakers. Uh, and it provides a compelling story that can often drive change at multiple levels, from the high level policymaker level, where they, they need to be convinced there's a compelling problem. There are thousands of problems out there they could focus on. Is this one compelling? That there's a workable policy option and that the politics are right for action at this particular moment in time. Uh, but that combination of evidence, values, and insights are also helpful for people who are uh, commissioning services, leading organizations, working in different types of associations, as well as for clients and citizen groups. So that's lesson eight. Lesson norm, uh, nine is, is moving from more of the supply side, us outside government, uh, to the demand side. And we give a number of examples uh, here. Uh, the one that I remain the most intrigued by is the research evidence checklist that we've seen used in some jurisdictions, uh, which needs to be completed before briefing materials are submitted to a minister or to cabinet. Hugely helpful in causing people to stand back and say, can we succinctly describe how we found and used evidence to inform our understanding of a problem, of options, and about implementation? And then, can we be clear about which databases we searched and what type of evidence, for example, systematic reviews of effects, we've found to inform this work. Uh, and if, for example, someone were asked to review the literature or to, to submit a briefing to a minister about a particular health system arrangement and hadn't searched health systems evidence, it would be a good opportunity to push it back and to request that they go to a source that people understand to be comprehensive uh, to make sure that nothing, nothing was missed. I won't go through the other examples, but you'll see other examples of how uh, groups are trying to institutionalize uh, the use of evidence uh, in policy environments. Lesson 10 is about evaluating innovations and make adjustments as needed. So we can point to many examples of direct impacts on the policy process, including, as I mentioned before, seven weeks from a call to a cabinet decision. Uh, we have huge amounts of evidence uh, about how briefs and dialogues lead to strong intentions to act. We also have large amounts of evidence from the forum as well as from our partners in many other countries about the high ratings of the design features for things like our briefs and dialogues um, as well as for now our citizen panels. And one of the interesting things is we see a virtuous cycle of more evidence-informed policymaking leading to more evidence-informed interest group pressure and more policy-relevant research. So those are our 10 uh, lessons learned at the forum. Some have been have stood the test of time almost a decade, such as uh, lesson number seven. Others for us uh, are newer. Lessons like lesson six, the importance of eliciting citizen values to drive the policy process also about the need for rapid syntheses to kind of come up the middle between the self-serve one-stop shop like health systems evidence and the more full-serve um, stakeholder dialogue typically informed by citizen panels. Uh, and others, uh, we've come to realize that we need to talk about uh, things in different ways, like lesson eight, uh, talk about the importance of best evidence, citizen values, and stakeholder insights. So those are our lessons learned. As I mentioned before uh, at the beginning of the webinar, um, these are really the substantive lessons that we've learned. We've also come to realize uh, because of work that we're now doing with 14 partners um, in other countries is that we have not done as good a job in documenting lessons learned on the operational side. The things that we have done over time, learned the hard way, uh, that need to be done if you're trying to be an organization that is responsive on a wide variety of uh, timelines, 
uh, that is constantly having to uh, make sure that it has the resources to keep a well-trained staff in place, and the list goes on. So we currently have a list of, of nine um, lessons learned, but we're going to be continuing to work on that list with our partners uh, to better document the lessons learned on the operational side. Uh, Another thing that I said at the beginning of the webinar that I was just going to quickly touch on lessons learned about how we communicate what we do. And so a few years ago at the forum, uh, we went through a process to reconceptualize how we talk about what we do. Um, and we now, if you were to go to our website, um, have five gateways into what we do. Uh, learn how, which is where things like our workshops fit in. Find evidence, which is where our one-stop shops, our rapid syntheses, and our two types of briefs fit in. Spark insights, which is where our citizen panels and our stakeholder dialogues come in. Uh, then I'm going to jump down one to embed supports. So uh, that's another area that we're trying to give much greater attention to, to help organizations institutionalize the use of research evidence. And the fifth area is evaluate innovations. You'll see two other things uh, on this slide. One is the numbers of different types of, of uh, products or workshops that we've done. Um, and the other thing that I was going to focus uh, point out was how this links to the lessons learned. So the only one, the only lesson learned that we don't have a distinct gateway for is use the resulting story to drive change, that fourth bullet point. Uh, and the reason for that is it's so embedded in the other points that we haven't singled it out. But that's a, a lesson learned on the uh, communications front uh, about how we now talk about our work. You will, and it's been a very long time since you would have heard us use the jargon of knowledge translation. Um, uh, so what we are instead focusing on are these very tangible areas that we're trying to provide assistance in. So the final comments that I'll make before I open it up uh, for questions are uh, directions we're moving in now. So in a way, these are emergent uh, lessons, uh, areas where we recognize we need to do better, and in some cases that we're taking steps towards them, in other cases they're planned steps. So the first direction, which we've actually been moving on for some time now, but we're formalizing uh, in a more explicit way, is engaging citizens. So you'll see in blue lower down, citizen briefs and citizen panels, which I've spoken about before, uh, but we're now also starting to develop um, and uh, provide workshops for citizens about how to find and use evidence and how to understand and strengthen health and social systems. So we've increasingly come to the view uh, that if we're trying to really make sure that we get the right program, services, and products to the people who need them, um, we desperately need to have citizens pushing for those changes themselves where we are in a supporting role uh, and they are in the lead role. Uh, and these workshops are for us the beginning of collaborations with different citizens to try to work out how can we best support them in developing and sharing the capacity to do this. Um, another area that we focused on this time in partnership with uh, four other groups at McMaster is in developing and supporting the use of the McMaster Optimal Aging Portal, uh, which provides citizen-targeted best evidence. Uh, and there are four types of content in the portal, all targeted at citizens, all helping them either make better informed decisions about their own health, self-management or treatment choices, uh, or helping them uh, understand what they sh should be or could be pushing for at the policy level uh, to make sure that the right program services and products are available for people like themselves. So that's uh, direction one, a direction we've been moving in for some time and plan to keep up. Uh, a second direction, which is newer for us, um, and it's work that we're very keen to uh, pursue in Canada, but we're also working with partners in a number of different countries uh, to learn from them about how they are doing this, 
is joining up the ecosystems of policy supporting organizations. So here what I've done in the left column is uh, provide labels for groups. Not all groups would recognize themselves in those labels, but we think of there being at least seven groups out there that are aiming to support policy in some form or, or another, data analytics groups, guideline groups, technology assessment groups, modelers, and so on. Um, each of them typically focuses on one or two phases of the policymaking process, even though they don't sometimes talk about it in that way. And they more often focus on program services and products than they do health and social system arrangements. Uh, but our view is that if you're sitting in government and committed to supporting evidence-informed policymaking, these are the types of people uh, who you either should be reaching out to or are now knocking on your door uh, with offers of help. But none of them have the solutions alone. And we have come to the realization that we, like these other groups, are part of a solution and that the future needs to include far more effort to join up these ecosystems within a given province or state or country uh, so that people are playing to their comparative advantages, but also involving other people who bring additional comparative advantages to the table. So this is a more emergent direction for us. A third uh, direction that we're moving in now is adapting, piloting, and iteratively revising these methods that I've talked about before uh, as we move from our historic focus on the health sector to now a broader focus on health and social systems. So uh, we now have an, in <clears throat> an initiative at the forum called Forum Plus for our work outside of health. Um, and we're, we're now working in partnership with a network of four con 14 country teams um, that are taking these approaches, adapting them, piloting them, and iteratively revising them um, as we get better experience with them in the education sector, in the justice sector, in the environmental uh, sector. So this is for us a very exciting uh, area to try to understand how we need to adapt, pilot, and revise these approaches as we try to use them in other sectors. So this is a very emergent area, um, but another lesson learned that we simply can't take the methods we've been using uh, and apply them with without adaptation in other sectors. The final um, direction that we're heading in is also relatively new. Uh, we were asked by a uh, provincial government in Canada to do some work, a rapid synthesis on rapid learning in health systems. Uh, uh, this essentially turned on a light for many of us. We realized that this is perhaps the most exciting uh, framework that we've encountered that supports the type of bridge building that we talked about before and that constantly asks how can we prioritize moving the dial in ways that make a tangible difference in the impact of citizens and clients. Um, and use all of these insights about evidence, about data, about aligned governance, financial, and delivery arrangements. Uh, so what you see on this slide is the definition that we use, uh, and in the numbers are the seven characteristics of a rapid learning health or social system. Uh, so we're increasingly using this frame in all of our work, um, and it could be that within a few years we've moved away entirely from discussions of supporting evidence and informed policy making uh, to entirely a uh, language around rapid learning systems. For now, uh, we're using both sets of language uh, in a transitional phase, uh, but we're finding this framework to be hugely helpful uh, to nest our work within a bigger uh, strategy of making a tangible difference uh, to clients or patients uh, at the front line. So this for us is, is a much more recent lesson uh, learned about new directions. So those are the, the 10 lessons learned. Um, to summarize again, they're the more substantive 10 lessons that we've learned over the years. Some have to, um, have uh, shown them to uh, have been around for a long time. Some are more recent. 
Uh, I mentioned, though, we've also been starting to document operational lessons learned, and, and perhaps in a few years we'll have a webinar specifically focused on that. We, I had one slide about communication lessons learned, so we now talk about the five areas where we do work, our five gateways. And the final thing that I touched on were our lessons learned about where we need to move in the future. And I've given four examples of paths that were either currently on and have been on for a year or two or that we're, we're embarking uh, on right now. This final slide are, uh, is resources. If you want to see any more information or, or find any information about uh, what I've been talking about, you can go to some of these sites. Uh, I'll just point out two things that are in blue. Three things. One is our resources. We have a number of one or two page summary sheets uh, that cover a lot of key uh, insights from our work that you can access through our website. Uh, second, the rapid synthesis we did. Uh, we're currently in the process of doing a national review on this topic. Every Canadian provincial uh, uh, and territorial uh, health system, but for now what's available is the Ontario work. And the final thing is my, my Twitter uh, handle at the bottom at forum HSS, HSS standing for health and social systems. So I think that that's it. Uh, I'll skip this extra slide. It's just there in case I needed it. So I'll turn it back over to Steve um, for uh, moderating the questions. Great. Thanks very much, John, for your insights and uh, sharing those lessons learned from our work in supporting evidence-informed policymaking. Uh, we do have some questions that have come in, but I would certainly encourage anybody else if you have uh, Anything that you'd like to share or other questions, to please use the chat box to ask those. Uh, so the first uh, set of questions were actually from Olivia Bierman. She asked whether we think these lessons apply in the context of low and middle income countries. And then uh, secondly, also what types of research methods can be used more to investigate evidence informed policy making and the lessons learned? So great. Uh, so hi, Olivia. Good to um, see your name and, and uh, thank you for the question. So the, the lessons learned, uh, absolutely. You know, I, I said they're, they, they're from the forum, but of course the forum has learned a huge amount from our partnerships with uh, evidence-informed policy networks in a range of different countries. Um, and we have, uh, with our collaborators, um, talked about these lessons many, many times. We have a workshop coming up on Saturday and Sunday in Johannesburg where we'll be with uh, our 14 partners. Uh, and this uh, set of lessons is one of the first slides uh, to check in with them again that this reflects their experiences. I, I think that the uh, what, the lessons that, in fact, uh, to be honest, emerged more from them, and we have then acted on them, include uh, lesson five, uh, rapid synthesis. So um, we were, of course, aware of the importance of timely synthesis, but it was the practical experience of our colleagues in Uganda, Cameroon, and Burkina Faso, and seeing how policymakers in those three African countries embraced rapid synthesis as being so useful to their work that led us uh, to undertake um, uh, a similar program. Um, and maybe the one that has had less opportunity for experimentation in low middle income countries is citizen panels. So we only at this point uh, know of one uh, partner, uh, the Knowledge to Policy Center at the American University of Beirut, uh, who is using these in the ways that we mean uh, citizen panels here. So, uh, so perhaps less than five more coming from low middle income countries, and then we have embraced it and run with it. Uh, less than six perhaps coming more from us, at, but our three year uh, partnership with the 14 uh, country teams that I mentioned before will allow us to experiment with this approach to citizen and panels in a broad array of low middle income countries. So uh, I'll have to get back to you about six, but, but certainly the others um, uh, certainly resonate with our partners in low middle income countries. Then in terms of your next question, which Steve, can you just remind me, it was about what types of methods should we be using in evaluating whether we're making a difference in evidence-informed policy? What types of research methods should be used more to investigate evidence-informed policy making and the lessons learned? Yeah, so, you know, tough one. I mean, we, 
uh, you know, the difficulty to me with uh, evaluation in this space is that the gold standard for evaluating impact are remarkably labor-intensive case studies of policymaking processes where one can, can have the key informant interviews, the media analysis, the documentary analysis that provides you with a very nuanced understanding of whether and how the insights from uh, a variety of types of evidence influence the policy process and also how a particular dialogue or a particular panel uh, shapes thinking. Uh, and part of that is because we know that evidence can change how people think about problems, the more conceptual use of evidence. They can inform very narrowly defined uh, decisions, which would be a more instrumental use, and other times they can, uh, evidence can be used after the fact to justify a decision made for other reasons, which we can call a political use of evidence. And without that gold standard approach, um, it's very hard to do all of those. So um, where we have come to is when we are doing more evaluative research, to try to find intermediate outcomes, um, and the one that we've given the most attention to uh, has been in the area of um, the theory of planned behavior, people's intentions to act on what um, was learned, uh, which correlates quite well with actual behavior, but uh, also we collect the information on the three conditions under which intentions typically translate into actions. So we have a lot of different methods uh, that we use, but what's the most difficult is finding easy to measure outcomes that can be looked at in both an intervention and a control group. Uh, and so we have some lovely recent published examples like the SPIRIT trial out of Australia um, where people have tried to do this in a randomized trial context, but it is a, an extremely labor-intensive process that they went to, through with their outcome measures uh, and, and hard to imagine reproducing that at scale across contexts and issues, which is where uh, we think the future needs to go, is understanding under what context and for what issues do particular approaches or methods get traction. So I wish I, I had great answers, but you know, it's a complex field. It's always going to end up being multi-method, um, and it's going to require us to make a variety of different types of trade-offs, but that's where we are uh, in our thinking and what we continue to draw on as we, for example, embark on this new 14-country partnership. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, we have a number of other questions to get through here, okay. um, but there's... I'll, I'll be faster. Yeah, no, that's... It's good. It's good to have lots of questions. So there's a couple that have come through about um, the citizen panel program. So mm -hmm. they're similar, but you know, a slightly different take. So one asks how we might respond when evidence and citizen values that are at, are at odds. And uh, in a similar kind of vein, somebody asked about how to manage when the values are very diverse and polarized. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, uh, so great questions. Uh, you know, I guess I suppose the easy thing about you know not being the elected politician is that I can say that at the end of the day, it's those individuals that have to make these difficult trade-offs. They they're the ones that are elected. What we see our role as being is being very systematic in our approach to synthesizing the evidence and to eliciting the citizen values and eliciting the stakeholder insights and to present them in a way that is very transparent. Uh, but at no point do we give recommendations about how to uh, balance uh, those um, and certainly not when they are competing. Um, so we're, we're just we just try to be very transparent, put it in front of people, and then, you know, at the end of the day, they're the ones uh, that were elected and have to make the difficult decisions. So, I, you know, in a way, you could argue that I'm punting it, that I'm not taking responsibility, but I also feel that our responsibility in our role as what we hope are credible intermediaries between the world of evidence and policymaking 
is to bring to the table uh, insights that come from the use of systematic methods ap at applied and reported in ways that are very transparent. And that means not adding our own advice about how to balance those in inputs when they're conflicting. Um, on the polarization front, I mean, the interesting uh, thing, uh, I suppose, is uh, all, virtually all of our programs operate on a purely responsive basis. Um, we typically are not uh, the ones that are picking topics, um, and we have not been asked to take on issues that are highly polarizing, and that probably simply reflects, you know, the incredible experience of the many people who otherwise uh, come to us or who, who come to us for other topics who recognize when when people are when issues are highly polarized so uh with abortion with with uh some other issues the the probability of insights emerging from evidence that would help to uh, come to more of a shared view about where we need to go are extremely low. So uh, we have typically not been invited in to address issues where there exists already a tremendous degree of polarization. Um, uh, we, of course, encounter polarization sometimes, but not extreme, but we encounter some degrees of polarization at citizen panels and stakeholder dialogues. And that's why one of our, the features of both is we don't aim for consensus. We are not trying uh, to put square pegs in round holes and make people agree to things and make compromises. We're trying to capture areas of agreement where they exist and to document areas of divergence and, if possible, the, reason, the underlying rationales for that divergence uh, when that is the case. Um, and again, uh, you know, from a politician's perspective, that's helpful. They need to know, uh, are people on the same page about the problem and its causes? Uh, do they agree about the viability of particular solutions? Um, and then for them, are the politics right? And sometimes, uh, you know, and we're seeing this increasingly in the United States and in Ontario, politicians seem to be seeking out um, uh, policy issues that are polarizing, but typically uh, that's not their preference. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's up to them to, to figure out how, how to do that. So, so that's how we deal, that's our experience with polarization, that we're often not pulled in. And when we see it, we're trying to document and report it systematically. Um, but our methods, we don't think probably, are going to be the, a perfect solution for highly polarized situations where, you know, nothing else has worked and it's unlikely these would get much traction either. Great. Thanks, John. We had uh, just one other question about the citizen panels about uh, mm -hmm. whether the outcomes are made uh, available to decision makers. So I would just say that all of our products, including the citizen briefs, as well as the citizen panel summaries and our dialogue products are all available uh, on our website. Uh, so under the um, find evidence and our product section of the website. So they're all made available there. Uh, and then in terms of the panels that when we're doing those as part of the uh, the feedback that uh, that John you know mentioned that we certainly provide the, uh, the citizen uh, the summary of the discussions to, uh, to those involved. Um, the, another question in terms of resources that was asked, John, is whether the research evidence checklist or an example is available uh, somewhere that you, um, that you could point people to. Yeah, so the, the, the one, I, I can't point people uh, to it off the top of my head, but we'll figure out some way to, um, to flag this for people after the webinar. Steve, you'll have to help me thinking about how we do that. But there is a, a, a lovely documented example from the United Kingdom um, with their, with work that was done to support cabinet decision making there. Uh, the Ontario example, uh, as far as I know, is not in the public domain. We have a modified version of that checklist uh, that we're going to be putting in front of our 14 partners 
um, in the coming months uh, and ask and then work with them to collaboratively adapt it. Um, and once that work is done, then we're very happy to put that in the public domain. So the, the one thing that I know is in the public domain is the very well documented UK example. And within a few months, we will have the example um, that we're going to be piloting in the field with our partners in, in a variety of low middle income countries. Great. So what I would suggest, John, is that uh, when we have that, maybe what we can do is post that as a link on the page, uh, on our Learn How webinar page for this webinar, because yep, we will great. be posting the video there as well. Fantastic. Uh, so we have a few more questions. I'm not sure if we're going to get through all of them, but we'll try. Uh, so in terms of uh, the public education side, um, mm -hmm. this, this question was that uh, public education has struggled to use evidence in decision making. And have you encountered publicly funded education systems or tools that would you point to as exemplars? Uh, sorry, this, so this is about using these ideas in the education sector, is that right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so I, well, I think that we, uh, two of the 14 partners that we're starting this new program of work with um, are the uh, the Epi Center at University College London, um, and they are part of an institute called the Institute of Education that has been working in the education space for a long time uh, and working in partnership with, I believe there are two what work centers in the UK focused on education, um, one more um, uh, kindergarten to grade 12 and the other higher education. So those three entities uh, from an outsider perspective seem to be doing excellent work in this space. And then another partner is the Africa Center for Evidence that has been uh, similarly doing some uh, very, very interesting work in the education space. I believe in South Africa, I can't recall if it has also been in, in the sub-region. So those are our two examples, but part of our focus going forward with this 14 um, member coalition is to be actively seeking out uh, excellent examples in other sectors and applying these methods in these other sectors. So in the coming uh, few years, what we hope to be doing a lot more work in education and in other sectors and documenting whether and how the approaches uh, need to be adapted and, and so on uh, for those sectors and also documenting excellent examples of where uh, people in those sectors are embedding or institutionalizing these types of mechanisms. So in the short run, I would point you towards those groups. And in the, in the longer run, um, if you uh, sign up for our forum newsletter uh, or check our website periodically, we'll be increasingly sharing examples from education and other sectors. Great. So we have two minutes left and two more questions to get through. So uh, the first one is just about our communities of practice, how they work, how the topics are chosen and what the intended outcomes are? Yeah, so uh, communities of practice are a new area for us. We have a colleague, Kerry Waddell, who's been heading up that area. So in the interest of time, um, maybe what I can do is point you to her and we can make available her um, her email address. I think it's Waddell K W-A-D-D-E-L-L-K at McMaster.ca. Um, uh, and we're currently experimenting with them in Ontario. Uh, starting with the home and community care sector, and this is for us an experiment about how to do it. We're also setting up a community of practice among these 14 country teams spread around the world. So communities of practice for us is a newer area. Carrie's done excellent work summarizing the lessons learned uh, from that literature and using that to guide very practical advice that we're drawing on uh, as we experiment for the first times with formally managing or supporting uh, communities of practice. So uh, she would be uh, the best resource person on that front. Great, and you can also email us at forum at mcmaster.ca as well, and we can pass uh, those inquiries on. Um, so the last question is uh, about just more generally about the mission of the Health Forum and how it ties in with the growth of translational medicine as of late. Um, the person asked there said that it appears that the Health Forum emphasizes synthesis and accessibility of evidence-based health and social systems knowledge through systematic reviews by meta-analyses. 
uh, in a setting of the bench to bedside and community where the goal of accessibility and translation is emphasized, do you see this as possibly adding to the burden of unappraised knowledge or a sector that is necessary in an ever-changing dynamic field of medicine? It's a big question, but uh, you want to... What was the very last phrase? Is it what? Uh, do you see this as possibly adding to the burden of unappraised knowledge or a sector that is necessary in an ever-changing dynamic field of medicine? Yeah, I don't know why it would add to the the pool of unappraised. And I mean, because ev almost virtually everything we do is about presenting appraised um, uh, evidence and and I guess I've just put up a slide that was here as an extra one, which is uh, distinguishing uh, policy about clinical um, public health and health system arrangements. I mentioned before we work more in that blue circle, uh, and we sometimes work in the the intersection with the green and the purple circle, but we never uh, work in the yellow circle. And for me, that's where the, the transla translational medicine space is between the biomedical and clinical. So it, to be honest, it's just not an area that we work in and that I could speak knowledgeably about. So we're very much policy about health systems, sometimes policy about clinical and public health, but never that translational medicine interface between biomedical and clinical. There's many, many groups that would be uh, leap years ahead of us in terms of uh, knowledge and capacity in that area. Great. Well, thanks again, John, for taking your time today to share your insights and uh, lessons learned from our work in supporting evidence-informed policymaking. Um, if anybody would like to watch this part of uh, this webinar again or share it with their colleagues, we will be making the video recording available on our website. And uh, you can certainly go there as well to check out either past, uh, past top 10 webinars, and we will be posting some more details shortly about upcoming webinars this fall. So thanks again, John, and thanks to everybody for joining us today, and we hope you'll join us again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.